first off, I'd like to start off by saying Happy Veterans Day to everyone. And I'd like to use this opportunity to thank you and others who have served and sacrificed for this country so that we can be free and enjoy the things that we can do today. Thank you. Today is November 11, 2015, and we are interviewing Mr. Chad Miller and Mr. Brett King. Also, John Hunt in the theater of McHenry, McHenry East Campus. Um, Mr. Kenley is how old? Mr. Kenley is 34. Mr. Miller is 47. Mr. Hunt is 56. And you, uh, what day were you born on, Mr. Miller? September 16th. What day were you born on, Mr. Henry? December 13th. December 13th. And what day were you born on? February 16th. February 16th. My name is Samantha Ponticelli, and I will be interviewing them along with Eva and Rocky. Um, Miss Nam is recording the interview, and my U.S. History issues of the 21st century class is in the audience. <coughs> I'm a student at McHenry High School. Um, Mr. Miller, could you state for the recording what war and branch of service you served in? I was both in the Army and the Army National Guard. Um, due to my age, I'm one of the lucky ones that uh, I was one step ahead of the sheriff, I suppose. Uh, I was in OCS when uh, the first Persian Gulf War started. So being in a school, I wasn't able to be deployed. And for some reason, only he knows, I was always about a year or two ahead of every other activation. So I spent a little bit of time in Panama and some activations for the National Guard, but other than that, no wars. That's pretty, that's pretty interesting. Um, what was your rank? I finished as an O3 captain. Where did you serve? I'm sorry. Most, well, uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, Fort Gordon, uh, Georgia, and then most of my career was here in uh, McHenry County, both in uh, Woodstock and Waukegan. Mr. Kinney, could you state for the recording what war and branch of service you served in? I served also in the Army and the Army National Guard. What was your rank? I finished out as a sergeant. Where did you serve? Um, I served in a few different hospitals. I worked as a medic, and I was also cross-trained as a physical therapy tech. So uh, as how a doctor has a nurse, a physical therapist has a physical therapy tech, and that's what I did. Uh, I worked at Fort Riley, Kansas, working with a unit that came back overseas that was pretty badly injured. Uh, I worked at Walter Reed, um, and then uh, I didn't actually go overseas until I joined with the National Guard, and I went to Afghanistan. Uh, and worked as a medic for an infantry unit uh, working on the border of Pakistan. Um, and there, I just went on missions with the infantry and uh, maintained a 24-hour aid station. Thank you. That's good to be cool. Mr. Hunt, could you state for the recording what war and branch of service you served in? I was in the Army, um, Korea, Germany, Japan, Fort Riley, Gordon, Georgia, and let's see, Fort Bliss, Texas. That's about it. What was your rank? <laughs> well, I got busted right before I got out, so it was a BFC. Where did you serve? Where did I serve? Yes. Like the last duty station was Fort Riley, Kansas. Stock, Illinois, 1959. What were you doing before you entered this service? I was actually in this school. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Back in 74. That's pretty awesome. It's nice to have you back. Yeah. Mr. Miller, where were you, when and where were you born? I was born in 1968 uh, here in McHenry. 
What were you doing before you entered the service? Nothing good. <laughs> I, um, when I graduated high school, well, I wasn't the greatest student. Uh, and uh, when, when I graduated high school, I didn't, I think I graduated with like a 1.7 GPA. Uh, Although I scored well on my ACTs, I just didn't apply myself, so I was kind of going down down a path that uh, getting in trouble, uh, underage drinking, things things we shouldn't be doing, but you know, kids do, right? Uh, my father asked me kindly to not live with him anymore, <laughs> uh, so I was at a crossroad, and uh, a friend of mine had uh, had uh, joined the joined the guard and mainly did it for free college. So I was looking at that, um, you know, I spent uh, a whopping two weeks at uh, University of Wisconsin-Whitewater before they also kindly asked me not to go there anymore. So Dad took, uh, took my college money away, took, took basically, uh, you know, all my privileges away. And I knew at some point that I needed to change my life, so sat my friend down who had already been in now for a year. I didn't believe him. Uh, that, you know, why, if I, if I did one week in a month, two weeks in the summer, why would they give me $100,000 worth of schooling for free, right? It was all too good to be true. But at that certain point, uh, the, the decision-making point was, and again, I'm not proud of this, but yet I got I am. got a letter from the uh, Secretary of State that I happened to get three uh, traffic tickets in less than a year, and they were going to take away my, uh, my driving privileges for six months. And as I was sitting with the recruiter, it was you know, coincidental that my schooling was gonna last about six months. So uh, three days later, I go down to the map station that's in processing, and uh, off I went to Fort Benning, Georgia. And uh, best thing I ever did in my life. Not only was, was it true, and did uh, taxpayers pay for 100% of my schooling, uh, the other schooling that I was fortunate enough to get through my career uh, in, in the Army and the Guard uh, really changed my life. Uh, fact be told, I learned more through my Army training and um, the fraternity that, that, that the military really is than I ever learned in, well certainly not in high school, but than I ever learned in college, uh, that I ever learned with any other life experience. So without the uh, Without the Army, without the Army National Guard, I'd probably not be sitting anywhere near here. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> That's amazing. So, where were you born? When and where were you born, Mr. Miller? Or, well, I guess I'm the, I guess I'm the only non-local person. Uh, I was born in Tucson, Arizona. I moved up here uh, with my dad. Um, I had to find work. Um, and my story is pretty simple. I was not a good student. I wasn't. I wasn't getting in a lot of trouble, but I just was not a good student. I I was getting C's and, and kind of just rolling through high school. And I, you know, looking back now, I realized that I kind of, you know, it wasn't that I wasn't smart. It was just I didn't think I was smart. You know, um, so uh, but I did end up going to community college. My younger brother, who was two years younger than me, um, right out of high school. So I was in I was in college getting C's and kind of messing around and drinking and wasting my money, you know, just not really putting myself out there and really trying. So, uh, but you know, my brother, my brother's, uh, you know, finding success, doing cool things, uh, you know, calling me and letting me know what he's up to. And and there was a point when when I was just drinking pretty much every single day. I was I was going to UIC, uh, playing rugby. My goal wasn't to get to class on time. My goal was to make sure I had a good time the night before. And uh, and I just, I, I started getting, for lack of a better word, I just started getting depressed because I kind of felt like a loser. My younger brother, who is two years younger than me, is out finding success and becoming a man, and here I am still acting like a little boy. So um, in 2004, I finally had enough, and I said, okay, I'm just, I'm gonna join the Army too. You know, it seemed like the right choice for me at the time. And, and looking back, it was. I went and I, I did my six years, I trained, and what was frustrating for me when I got into the training was, you know, at, 
basic training, you you cannot fail. They make you go through everything. You, you know, if you think that you're done doing push-ups, you're not. You're doing more. If you think you're done hiking, you're not. You're going to do more. And and through that basic training process and my AIT training, I learned that it wasn't it wasn't my my body or or uh, it wasn't me that was that was uh, failing. It was my brain. It was it was me telling myself, yeah, that's the most you can do. But I. I realized through my training that there is more you can do it. Um, so once I did my six years, uh, I came back from uh, from training in the Army and I went back to USC. And what was really hard was I pushed all my hard classes to the end. I had I had anatomy and physiology, I had kinesiology, I had all these just ridiculously hard classes. And, and now I'm starting to get A's, you know? And it's just so frustrating because looking back on my life, um, once I had finished college, I started. That's when I started thinking about grad school or possibly going on in my education. But that door was already closed for me because prior to me going into service, I was getting C's, I was getting D's, I was not going to class, I was not volunteering, I was not taking internships, you know. And so once I, by the time I found out that I could succeed, it was already too late for me because my prior actions. So although, although I wasn't able to go on in my life in that aspect, the Army gave me some really good skills that I was able to use. Now, I'm a police officer here in McHenry, um, and, and I've got a great family, I've got a great life, but I attribute all of that to the military because I, that's where I learned how to be disciplined, how to find success, and, 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 um, and how to grow and become a man. So that, that's how I kind of got into it. So, uh, we'll start off with Mr. Kirby. Keep the talk. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, in which branch of military did you serve? I was in the Army, the regular Army, for three years. And then um, once you get out of the Army, you have to do what's called IRR, uh, an inactive reserve. Um, and pretty much what they tell you is you don't have to do anything, but if World War III were to happen, calling you back up and you're going back in. So instead of just sitting at home and doing nothing during that IRR time, I ended up joining the National Guard um, and just training, you know, the one week in a month, two weeks a year, I think, for those three years. Okay, um, so did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted. Yep. Uh, why did you choose that specific branch of the military? I chose the Army because my brother was in the Army. And I, I literally went into the recruiting office and said I wanted to join the Army. I didn't say I wanted to be a medic. I didn't say I wanted to be a physical therapy tech. I just said, get me in as soon as possible because, like I said, I I really didn't feel like I was doing anything successful in my life. I was just kind of, a, you know, floating. I wasn't doing anything bad. I wasn't breaking laws and stuff, but I I just I wasn't attributing to society. I was just floating. And so, uh, you know, I, I told them, whatever gets me in the Army, the fastest, whatever job, get me into that. And I was at, uh, I was at MEPS getting, getting processed and everything. Way, would you say you looked up to your brother? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And yeah, like I said, it was a weird situation because I, he's two years younger than me. We grew up our entire lives, you know, where I was, you know, it was it was him following me. I played football, he played football. I went to high school, he went to high school. So it was he was always a little one step behind. And it was frustrating when I was in college. Is is I'm now I'm watching him surpass me in my mind because you know, as I said, I kind of plateaued out after high school. I just plateaued and just kind of floated. I wasn't. I had no major, I had no idea what I wanted to be, I had no, no goals, I, you know, I had a five year plan, I had nothing, you know, I was just going day by day, and here's my brother, he's planning for when he gets out, he's planning for his future as uh, an older gentleman and his pension, he's, he's, already, he's got plans, and, and it was frustrating to watch. So that's that's when I made the decision, you know, if I, if I can't make this, if I don't know what I want to do right now, then I'm gonna join the military, kind of grow up, mature, so then, what happened when you departed from training camp during the early days of training? It was it was pretty hard. Um, you know, at that time, I I was dating, my wife. Now I dated her in high school, and uh, so by the time I had left, we had been dating for four years. Um, when I told my mom that I was going into the army, she already had one son in Iraq, um, so she wasn't happy. My dad wasn't you know he wasn't horribly upset about it, but he also wasn't happy because you know. Although, although any time you go overseas is dangerous, the, the earlier you go, the more dangerous it is because things haven't been set up to, to kind of protect you. So my brother was there really early, and, and uh, so my mom was really scared. And, and I wasn't scared, but you know, I, I was leaving behind my family for a, at least a year of training. You don't, you know, I didn't get to come home for Christmas. I didn't get to come home for that first whole year because, you know, basic training was so long, medic school was so long. Uh, physical therapy school was so 
everything you have, they're building buddies, and, and it really does build a good bond with those guys. Very nice. So, Mr. Miller, uh, around you, in what, which branch of the military do you serve? Uh, the same, both uh, the Army and, and mostly National Guard. Yeah. So, did you enlist or did you draft? I did. I, I enlisted, uh, uh, went away as an E1. Um, by the time I was done with the Army stuff, got out as a, as a four. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have to be able to have two MOSs. First one was infantry, second was communications. So it got me a, a, a good base of, uh, of, of education and, and job training so I could go just about anywhere I wanted to. So when I first got out, I was a communications chief for the Woodstock Army National Guard. Did that till uh, E6 and then uh, when I really said, okay, this is this is a fit for me. This is this is neat, and got along real well with everybody there. Uh, diverse in terms of age. I was obviously one of the on the younger side, but there were guys in their 50s still still going and, and taking good from it. So I just said, okay, I'll, I'll I'll try to make this a career, and uh, so I went away to OCS. Uh, then got out. I uh, was then lucky enough to command two companies. Um, and one of which was the last, we were on the last rotation through Jungle Warfare School in Panama, Fort Sherman, uh, three weeks before we gave the canal back to the uh, Panamanians. So. so did you have a deliberate uh, choice for this branch? Yeah, you know what, it was, uh, you know, I go back to how I didn't apply myself in high school very well. Uh, Found out I was a lot smarter than I thought I was. I scored very, very high on the ASVAB. So I was fortunate to sit down, and I was a kid, again, running away, trying to get away as fast as I could. So very similar, I looked at the jobs that would have me ship within two to three days. Uh, I was athletic, uh, and I figured if I'm gonna do this, I don't wanna spend a bunch of time in a classroom, because at that point in my life, I wasn't very good at it. But I knew I could run, and I could hit things. So the infantry was, you know, right up, right up my alley there. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Hunt, in which branch of the military did you serve? <coughs> in, uh, Army, did four years. And then I got out, couldn't handle it. So I joined the National Guards over in Woodstock. I'm like, no, this ain't gonna work either. Because back then all they did was in charge of sergeants because I had more time to drink. They didn't like it. And so then they tried to make it rough. But again, overcome the death and improvise, I just kept on going, getting my time. And then I got tired of it. I had to get a haircut and shave it. And I'm like, no, this ain't gonna work either. How long do I got? Well, I can go. Thank you. See ya. Nice. So when you listen, why did you choose sidewalks are small. I mean, <laughs> small. So we would get a Dodge, the Dodge M880, that's a pickup truck, and we would go down to the village. And back in the day, I don't know if you remember them, but when you got milk, it was in the creek. Well, that's how they sell their beer. And it ain't little 
bottles. It's pretty big. And then we'd go down there and get that, and we'd come walking back to the woods, and it would be clinking. And we're on the Russian border. Hello, you got to be quiet there, because they don't want us to know that, hey, they're there, we're here. So we would have to stick ice, snow and ice in there and quiet up the bottles, and then sit back and make the, uh, take the cans and whatever, and make little cannons and shoot it. As old as I am, or not that old, it, it, it started with literally sending mail. We didn't we didn't have access to a phone, but on the weekends, um, you know, when I was when I was active, um, and then as I got a little older in my career, you know, we didn't even have cell phones back then, guys. Can you imagine not being able to text your mom or dad or friends back home? Uh, but then technology came. Uh, and emails came out. Uh, and in fact, uh, we were all issued a, a us.gov email address. That was the first email address I had ever had. I didn't even know what email was back then. You know, and that was my, in my early 20s. So things obviously progressed. Now, now everybody can stay in touch with everybody, <clears throat> unless you're in a training school. You know, but he, my son, lucky enough, he went he went through two years ago Fort Benning. As soon as he hit week six of, of basic training, they gave him their phones back. That blew my mind. So I was texting my son almost every night. So things have really changed. Really changed. So. What did you do for recreation or with the Rocky? Well, many things up. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know of, anyway. Um, you know, we make light of it, but. The, the, the thing, especially in basic training, uh, and, and especially if you're in a Konos unit, that, that you stay with your group, which I, I pretty well did, you become real tight because through basic, the, 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 the main focus is to break you down as an individual, uh, get, get rid of all your individual traits in terms of getting certain tasks done, and then build you back up as a group. Well, part of that building back up as a group, uh, you stay real tight, you know. Um, I'm proud to say I'm still in contact with folks that I went through basic training 30 years ago with uh, for that. So there's always something to find to, to do. Uh, but again, in most training scenarios, there's not much downtime. Uh, and then in most activation scenarios, there's not much freedom anymore today to go do things. So you get creative and, you know, figure stuff out. And I'll leave it at that. Mr. King, how did you stay in touch with family and friends back home? When I went through, uh, when I went through basic training, you got one phone call as soon as you got there just to say, hey, I'm here. And then, uh, you know, every two or three weeks they would let you make like a two minute phone call. Uh, but, uh, so a lot of it was just through handwritten letters, which was super awesome when your drill sergeant would get your letters and then open them and read them <laughs> But when I, so when I was in basic training, um, I didn't get to call home a whole lot. Uh, a buddy of mine ended up finding a random payphone just outside of our barracks by the laundromat. So sometimes we would sneak out at night and just quickly make a call. And uh, I can remember a couple of times when we'd hear someone coming, so we'd go in the laundromat and get into the dryer's and hide in there because if you got caught, you were done. You know, so it was it was you know fun to mess. There's, there, in the initial part, like Mr. Miller was talking about, in the initial part, you don't really get to talk to your family a whole lot. And the whole purpose of that is to get you, get you broken down so that you can get into a, a military lifestyle. Um, but when and, and when I ended up going overseas into Afghanistan, I was at a, a really, really remote base, and all we had was a, a, a radio for um, communication back to the larger base. So um, every once in a while, probably I would say probably once a month, they would fly in a, a satellite for us. And but even when I was overseas, it was just handwritten letters. We didn't have any internet service, just a radio phone. Um, 
training, I was with a lot of guys, but once I got into the hospitals, um, it was it was just me and the doctor, and so, and I flipped from hospital to hospital kind of quickly, so I didn't really get to meet a whole lot of people there, so that was kind of a lonely time, but I found, you know, I, I found exercise, I started uh, running a lot, um, but when you're in basic training, you know, you just train all day long, and then you eat dinner, and then you go and change your boots and go to bed, you know, but you, you find things to do, you find, you find things to do with you guys, um, overseas, um, in our downtime, we would watch a lot of movies on, on, the, on the laptops, um, play cards a lot, you know, every once in a while. I was with all guys, so, you know, guys were stupid, so we do stupid things, um, you know. But it was, it's a, it's, it's, it's a good time with those guys, just like Mr. Miller said, I still have guys that I talk to, even though I haven't seen them for 10 years, I still talk to them on the phone probably. He's still in. He's still in the army. He's a lifer, um, and he was actually he's a mechanic now. He he was uh, in Afghanistan um, when they technically said the war was over. So he did a lot of the shipping back of equipment and stuff like that. Um, but it was you know I was happy. It was that was you know there's there's still a lot of bad stuff that happens over in the Middle East and and whether or not we should be there I don't know. But it was it was good to hear because my brother at that time was on his fifth. Got two kids. Um, he had been married for three of those tours of duty, and it just didn't seem like it was going to end for him. He was actually getting to a point where he was willing, he was thinking about giving up all of his years of service to finally be done. Because it's just deployments are really burdensome. Uh, and on a single guy, you know, it's still burdensome. But if you if you got a family and you have a wife and you're trying, you know, it's it's just really hard on them. Um, you know, and I was, I was watching him beat himself up over. So I was really happy that, it was, that we were going to start scaling down our involvement with it. So how did you readjust to this? Uh, when I got back, um, I was, so after I got done with Afghanistan, I was done. And my contract was up um, while I was overseas. So when I got back, I just turned in my, my equipment and it was over. Um, and it was, 